Hello, this is Russell Moore, and you're listening to The Russell Moore Show, brought to you by Christianity Today. Every week, we explore here conversations and questions from a Christian perspective to help you sort out how to live as a follower of Jesus in confusing times. And this week, we have a conversation to seek to do just that. We have a segment here at the Russell Moore Show called Tell Me Where I'm Wrong. This is kind of one of those uh, episodes because I'm talking to somebody who has a very, very different view of um, the, the nature of the universe. I mean, the, 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 very, um, the very name of his book, Fluke, is about as opposite from Romans 8, 28, God works all things together for the good of those who love him, those who are called according to his purpose. Uh, so he has a very different view, and he's going to tell me why he thinks I'm wrong about a, a personal meaning behind the universe. But I also think that there are going to be some things uh, that we actually can learn from even where we disagree. So Brian Kloss, who's an American political scientist, writer for The Atlantic, hosts the Power Corrupts podcast and is a professor of global politics at University College in London, has written about power and all kinds of things. And now we're going to talk about chaos theory. And it, it, you might think, listen, that oh, chaos theory doesn't have anything to do with, uh, with me. Well, here's how it does. If you think about Peter Kreeft, the philosopher, uh, talks about uh, the fact that if Joseph had not ripped his his robe in uh, in leaving the encounter with Potiphar's wife, he wouldn't have ended up in prison. If he hadn't ended up in prison, he wouldn't have been interpreting these dreams. Uh, if he hadn't been interpreting the dreams, he wouldn't have been. Uh, he wouldn't have been elevated to his role of governance in Egypt. If he hadn't done that, he wouldn't have been able to save his brothers from the famine. And if he hadn't done that, then the sons of Israel would have died out. And if they had, we would have had no David, no Solomon, no Bethlehem, no Jesus. And so Crave's point is all of the salvation of the world the hopes and fears of all the years were all based on how good a work a tailor did with some seams. We're going to talk about the details of your life and whether that matters and whether that has meaning. You talk about uh, in the book, Nagasaki and Hiroshima. And how a, a really minor uh, sort of decision changed the whole sweep of uh, Western history. What was that decision? Yeah, so the, the story that opens the book is the, a, a vacation that a couple takes in 1926 to Kyoto, Japan. So Mr. and Mrs. H.L. Stimson go to Kyoto, and they fall in love with the city. They have that experience all of us do when we go on vacation and get a soft spot for a place. And 19 years later, the husband, Henry Stimson, uh, had become America's Secretary of War. So he was the chief civilian who was overseeing everything to do with the war campaign. And so when the decision was being made of where to drop the first atomic bomb, the generals got together in something called the Target Committee, along with some scientists, and they unanimously agreed that Kyoto was the top choice. And Stimson sort of sprung into action and twice met with President Truman and got it taken off the list. And so that's why the first bomb went to Hiroshima and the second bomb went to Nagasaki because the original target, Kokura, had cloud cover over it when the bomber uh, arrived. And so I opened the, the book that way because I'm trying to make the point that this 19-year-old decision to go on vacation in one town versus another meant that 100,000 people died in Hiroshima rather than Kyoto. And mm -hmm. that a passing cloud meant that the people died in Nagasaki rather than Kokura. And 
I think this is how the world works all the time, but rarely do we see these glimpses where the small decisions add up to the big consequences, even as they are happening all around us. Do you think that the fact that multiverse themes in novels and movies, I mean, I think of Blake Crouch's Dark Matter is uh, about to come out as I think a Netflix uh, series all about someone who the little decisions that he made changed the course of his life and he's trying to to reverse engineer some of those. Uh, there's there's so many plots like this. Do you think that is because we intuitively know that our little decisions matter? Or are we becoming more aware of that in this kind of weird scientific era we're in? Yeah, so I think it's, it's a great question, because I think what's happening is that all of us sort of intuitively understand this as we go through life, as we grow up and so on. And the, the clearest cut way I try to describe this is that whenever there's a science fiction plot that involves time travel to the past, very often the, the premise, which we all accept, is that if you tweak this little detail in the past, then the future, which is now our present, could be rather different. And it could even delete yourself or humanity from history. That's the sort of premise of these sci-fi books or, or, or films. Mm -hmm. And we completely throw this out the window when it comes to the present. Right. We never think that like the moment that we have right now is reshaping the future a thousand years down the road or even 500 or 50 years down the road. And I think, you know, the, the reason why that is that we've sort of lost touch of that with that uh, clear cut truth, which I, I think this is exactly how the world works. Right. I think that these small things do create deviations that produce change over uh, long stretches of time. I think the reason we've lost sight of that is because so much of our world is modeled now. So we have, you know, economic models, we have everything that is around us is built on models, which are basically simplifications, where we're told that the little details are unimportant, right? This is mm -hmm. the noise of life, you get rid of the noise, you focus on the signal. And so when I talk to people about the ideas that I've been writing about, I always say, you know, is there a moment in your life that you can pinpoint with this tiny little detail change your life forever? And the answer is always yes. Mm -hmm. And of course, the answer is also that I don't know, because we could never see what the alternative reality might have been had we turned left rather than right or gone to that school rather than this school, and so on. And so I think the multiverse is tapping into this, that there's a, a sort of a juxtaposition between how we understand the nature of our own lives, which is very disordered at times and, and rides on chance and little decisions versus the sort of neat and tidy stories of the world that we tell ourselves through models. And I think this is where science fiction is getting a lot of viewers because they're trying to grapple with these principles of what if, which is probably the most important and difficult question that all humans ever ask themselves. I, I think there are some people for whom there's the opposite effect. They're kind of uh, bound up with anxiety precisely because they know that little decisions they're going to make are going to change everything. And so they don't want to make make uh, decisions or they're they're bound up with regret constantly going back and saying, well, what if I had done this rather than that? What if I had not taken that first drink? What if I had dated this person instead of that person? And it, it kind of creates this paralysis. Have you noticed that in anyone? Yeah. And I think this is where, so this is the other reason why I wrote Fluke is on a personal level, I have a, a very sad story in the beginning of the book about a, a woman who has a mental breakdown in 1905 in her farmhouse in, in Wisconsin and takes the lives of her four young children and then uh, her own life. And this is my great grandfather's first wife. So he came home and found his entire family dead and ended up remarrying eventually to my great grandmother, which produces the lineage that, you know, is why I exist, why we're having this conversation. And so when I found this out, you know, in my mid 20s, and this is where it gets to your question, I realized that every joy in my life wouldn't have existed but for the terrible, horrific suffering of those innocent young children. And so, you know, when you have a life like that, where you sort of viscerally understand that you're joys or the outgrowth of their pain and vice versa. I think to me, it gives me this sense that, you know, you can never know what's going to happen. Of course, she did not understand that her decision was going to produce me or this podcast conversation or anything that I've done in my life. And so to me, I think there's this sort of mystical wonder that does exist in the world, whether it's in the realm of religion or science, whatever, that we cannot forecast the future. And that mm -hmm. uncertainty to me is really uplifting, actually, because it means that 
even when you make mistakes, you sometimes produce good effects. It doesn't mean you should make mistakes. Obviously, I would rather that, you know, she had not killed her children, although for me, it's, you know, I wouldn't exist. So, but it is one of these things where you sort of understand that, you know, you can go out and plant a tree tomorrow. And maybe in 100 years, a child will fall and, and hurt themselves from that tree. That doesn't mean you shouldn't, right? It yeah. means that you live probabilistically. You try to do what you think is the best thing in the moment. But it also sort of gives you the sense that there's this very uncertain future that you're constantly rewriting as part of your life. But, you know, I, I don't find myself crippled with anxiety or doubt. I just try to live as best I can. And I don't know how it's going to turn out. And I think that's the best that humans can do. I think that we delude ourselves when we try to assert complete control mm -hmm. over a world that we fundamentally cannot control. And, and I think there's a lot of mistakes and hubris that come from that worldview, which is, you know, the worldview of sort of controlling the world through models, manipulating it, and also sort of saying uncertainty in every way is bad. I think uncertainty can be uh, quite good sometimes. So that's a long-winded way of saying that I, I think there's this sort of aspect of the future that is just unknowable, and maybe that's good for us. Right now, right before we had our conversation, there was a new poll that came out on the presidential campaign and uh, in the United States, and I had, I don't know, seven friends immediately who are sending me this poll and saying, what does this say about November? And I, I wonder if one of the reasons that polling is so bad right now, when you look at kind of post-2016, is for that very reason. There was an assumption in 2016 that the fundamentals were what mattered and that and that you just look at the fundamentals, it's going to work. And then there were some flukish things that happened in some events and in, and in some particular states. And we just weren't ready for that in this kind of era. Yeah. So... You know, when I think about the fundamentals, what I would say is that people try to read into them extensively. The fundamental I can put, you know, I, I would bet on is the race will be somewhat close. That's mm -hmm. the only fundamental I can tell you, right? And I think the obvious problem with polling, which is not to take on the polling industry, they're trying to do their best with an uncertain future. It's that if I said to you, okay, I'm going to poll who's going to win the you know, election in 30 years, you would say this is ridiculous, right? Yeah. So all it is is a question of when does it become meaningful? And if we're going to say, okay, six months out, five months out, we can now do this. Well, people will have different views on this. And my view is the world is going to be different in November than it is in, in May. And so I can't forecast, and the polls are not trying to forecast, really. What the, what the polls are trying to do is saying, if the election was held today, who would win? But the mm -hmm. election's not held today. And a lot of stuff is going to happen between now and November. And I think all this stuff about October surprise and so on, it's, it's as though there is a, a race that happens before, and then there's this sort of shifting thing. There's only one race, and it's November. And that's the only poll that matters. And I think you know, what people tend to believe is that these opinions or viewpoints are fixed. I, there might be another war. I mean, in, in, in 2020, there was a pandemic that broke out in March. I mean, you know, all the polling in February, it had nothing to say about the November election because this massive upheaval of the world happened. So all I would say is, as someone who's a political scientist, is I will guess that this is going to be a close race. Anyone who tells you that they know what's going to happen beyond that is not telling the truth. It's fundamentally impossible to know what's going to happen because the world is not a static thing. I wonder your response to this statement. God has decreed in himself from all eternity by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will, freely and unchangeably, all things whatsoever comes to pass. Yet so as thereby God is neither the author of sin, nor has fellowship with any therein, nor is violence offered to the will of the creature, nor yet is the liberty or contingency of second causes taken away, but rather in established in which appears his wisdom in disposing all things and power and faithfulness in accomplishing his decree. Some 17th century uh, wording there, but the, the general idea being that everything happens according to the will of a personal being. How would you respond to that in terms of your viewpoint and fluke? Yeah, so I, I love this question because one of the surprises, I think, in, in writing this book, I was, I was a little bit worried actually about how it was going to be received by people who were particularly devout. And personally, I'm not, right? So, I mean, I, I'm pretty yeah. straightforward about this in my writing. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a believer. But 
what I found is actually there's a lot of common ground between people who sort of view God as the author of everything and what I am, which is a hard determinist according to the laws of physics, right? Mm. And so what's really interesting, I I had some fascinating conversations about this with people where I said, look, you know, I think that stuff happens in this unbroken chain of causes and effects. And so I, I personally don't believe in free will in the form of, you know, that I can choose everything that I want to about my life. I think a lot of it is determined for me by my parents, by all sorts of things in my genetics, et cetera, as well as the fact that I believe that my mind and my brain are basically the same thing. I think there's physical matter in my brain that is causing me to behave in certain ways. Now, that's a radically different viewpoint than someone who is thinking that they are the instrument of God in a way. But there is actually some commonality here because you sort of think that you are living out uh, some sort of predetermined or or somehow influenced part of your behavior. And for me, that's not God. It's physical causes through science and rationality and things that came before me in this unbroken chain back to the Big Bang. But what's what I think is really interesting about these ideas is that the fact that there's an overlap tells you that there is something where humans are grappling with this underlying question of whether we are the authors of our own destiny or not. And, you know, this, this is the stuff where theology and science are actually not as far apart as I think sometimes people believe, because they're trying to answer the same question. And so, you know, I, I don't pretend to be a theologian of any sort whatsoever. Uh, you know, I mean, I was raised Catholic, but, but uh, I, I lapsed and so on. But it, it's the kind of stuff where I think there's this big underlying question that a lot of people in society are not asking themselves. And I think whether you're a believer or not, it is the central question, right? It's the, it's the question of why things happen. And I think basically science and religion are trying to answer that question just from slightly different frames of reference. And so, yeah, that's, that's where I come down on it. But I do, I do believe in determinism. Uh, I believe that the causes of my actions are sort of in this unbroken chain of causes and effects through the laws of physics that have produced me. And, and so, yeah, I, I was really heartened when I saw some early reviews of the book on, you know, of, of reader reviews, where some very devout people found that it resonated with them, not because they agreed with me in terms of the mechanism, but because they agreed with me the, of the philosophy of what happens if you believe you have less control than, say, the 21st century self-help industry tells you you have. And I think that's the sort of area where there's the overlap that, that was interesting. So I guess the, the, the main difference would be, other than, than the obvious, but uh, Frederick Buechner, who was a novelist and essayist Christian, argued one time that because he was a, a novelist, he became accustomed to looking for plots and seeing plots. And over time, he started to think that his life itself and life itself seemed to have a plot line. That things were things were leading in a certain direction that he could see as as a novelist. Uh, I suppose the difference would be that you're saying there is a plot line of sorts, but it's it's happening for impersonal reasons. It, it's kind of almost an AI program as opposed to a a novelist writing writing a story. Would that be correct in terms of the metaphors? Well, I think I think the what I would say is that in both versions there's a script, and in both versions, whether it's religion or science, we can't know what the script is going to do next, right? Mm-hmm. And so, what what I where I think I come into this where there's some overlap with religion is that because my argument is that these tiny little details can sway reality in profound ways, sometimes for completely arbitrary reasons, right? I mean, the the vacation in Kyoto that causes 100,000 people to live or die, somebody might interpret that as the hand of God that's dictating this trajectory of these people. I don't see that, but I see that there's these arbitrary forces that may produce really consequential effects and nobody can forecast them. Nobody can understand them. So that sort of mysticism, I think, exists for both science and religion. I think the uncertainty and unknowability of the future is something that both realms grapple with precisely because the details matter. Right. Mm-hmm. So what, what science does that I think is hubristic, and this is where the realm of chaos theory actually, I think, fits in with religion a bit as well. Chaos theory argues that the tiniest details can produce the biggest effects. Right. So like a butterfly flapping its wings can eventually produce a hurricane. And so if we apply that to our own lives, then like, you know, turning left rather than, le- than right can make you meet a different spouse or have a different child or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And so the question then becomes, is there, uh, is there some sort of force that's dictating this, that's writing the script? And I don't think so, but I'm totally philosophically aligned with the idea that the conclusions can actually have some overlap, right? Because, 
I sort of think, you know, I have no idea what's going to happen in my life. I don't, you know, I've, mm-hmm. if I look back on what's happened in my life, I did not anticipate any of the things that have occurred. And so, you know, that's where I think the question becomes, how do you derive meaning from those somewhat overlapping worldviews that have totally different causal mechanisms behind them. One is more arbitrary, accidental, even random at times with, you know, molecules, you know, sort of knocking into each other and producing outcomes. And the other is the hand of God in, in scripting this stuff, even though we can never know what that script is going to be. So what I found the most interesting and uplifting about writing this is that I think for both worldviews, the third part of the subtitle of the book applies, which is why everything we do matters. And it's this idea that there's no throwaway action, right? That everything that you do in your life is important. And a person who's religious will say that because they'll say every tiny sin is important, just as every act of kindness is important. And I believe the same because of chaos theory. How do you avoid fatalism? So so if you think about those those little decisions, some of the little decisions that we make, uh, we, we obviously can't predict at all what they're going to, to lead to the tree that the kid falls out of 30 years later. But there are other things where we, we can say, I'm making these small decisions that are moving me in a in a likely bad direction. And how how do you then, if you see yourself as physical all the way down and a subject in some ways to forces outside your control. Is there anything you can do about the trajectory of your future? Yeah. So I think this is a question when you think about it philosophically about on the one hand, what is causing things and the other is how you are experiencing them. Right. Mm. So whether or not I can independently cause my behavior is a question that philosophers have debated for thousands of years, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's the fundamental question of free will. I don't have the answer. I personally believe I can't, but that doesn't, it, it, functionally for how I live, it doesn't really change anything because either way I feel that I can, right? I mean, all mm-hmm. every single human has the feeling of free will. And so I think that means that it's very important that you live according to your beliefs, that you try to do the best thing, right? And, and, and sometimes this will produce, sometimes good intentions produce terrible consequences and bad intentions produce good consequences. But on balance, you should live probabilistically, right? That if I plant trees more of the time than not, this will be good. Every so often someone might fall out of it, but that doesn't mean I should never plant a tree, right? So th- the way that I think about this is, I find it the exact opposite of sort of nihilistic beliefs. I think when a lot of people come to me after having read the book, there's sometimes people, every so often someone will say, well, how do you not become a nihilist? That nothing's important because there's no control or there's no uh, ability to sort of you know, for, forecast the future. And I use this phrase where I say, um, you know, we, we control nothing, but we influence everything. It's a, a subtle recalibration of how we think about our, our way that we imprint ourselves on the world. And I think in that world, I think it's the exact opposite of what a lot of the 21st century malaise is. I think a lot of people feel interchangeable. You know, AI and robotics is making you feel replaceable, that humans mm-hmm. don't have a purpose. And I think what I'm arguing is exactly the opposite, that the tiniest details of your life are going to shape the trajectory of future people and the people around you. And it matters down to the, t- t- to the littlest detail. I mean, whether you hit the snooze button or not mm-hmm. in a given morning, I have this phrase I coined called the snooze button effect where I say, you know, if you, if you hit the snooze button this morning or you don't, your life will diverge. You'll have different conversations that day. You'll meet different people. So the tiniest decisions are going to reshape trajectories of, of individual lives. And so for me, that's like the most uplifting message possible. It means that there's no throwaway part of my life. There's nothing that's just meaningless. And, you know, how that fits into a religious philosophy, I'm not sure, but I think it's one where, the, the, for, for me at least, uh, it is the antithesis of nihilism and sort of this idea of fatalistic uh, belief. So, yeah, I mean, I think I personally find it uplifting. Some people might find it bewildering and, and depressing, but it's, you know, it's up to you to sort of solve the philosophical puzzle as you will. Well, everything matters in, in this view. Does, does, does a life, though, have meaning? That's a very good question. It's a very difficult one. Um, what I derive meaning from is the fact that I am, and I find this incredibly beautiful, even as someone who is, you know, putting my faith p- predominantly in science, is I think it's incredibly unlikely that I exist, right? <laughs> Whether this is through the hand of God or through uh, a series of 
chemical reactions and, and, and ch a chain of physics for 13.8 billion years, you know, which is what science suggests the age of the universe is. I find it incredibly improbable that I would exist and that I get to experience being part of this unbelievably cool place that is the earth with these unbelievably cool creatures, which are humans, right? So for me, the meaning is being part of this sort of awe and wonder of the universe. And that is, I mean, what a gift. Uh, you know, I, I think that people who are in science can talk about this in exactly the same way who are talking about it in religion. Because, I mean, there are just an infinite number of ways that the world could be. And it's this way. And it's with all the beauty and joy, of course, with suffering too, but all the amazing things that makes humanity special. And, and so that's what I derive meaning from. I think the problem is that, you know, people do worry that if they can't control stuff, if they don't have free will, for example, do they lose a sense of meaning through their life? And that's a question that everybody answers differently if they end up believing that. And, and of course, there is some, you know, in predestination and in theology and so on, there's questions of, is, is God just revealing the world to you? And, and sort of what kind of person you are, there's some theologians who take that, that view. And that would be the same sort of thing, right? That you're sort of, you're maybe not an independent author, but you're sort of part of this divine script, or in my case, part of this incredible, you know, chain reaction of, of things that have happened in the universe that have culminated in, in us. So I find meaning in it. But I wish we talked about this more. You mentioned in the book, The, the Garden of Forking Paths. And I, I wonder, when you think about the idea devel that developed quite a bit since then of a multiverse, that, that every decision is creating a fork and creating another reality, is that for you metaphorically? Or do you think objectively there's, there's a, a multiversal reality out there? Where there's uh, a, another another sort of of uh, forked out reality, there. Yeah. So th this is a question that is absolutely impossible to answer. It's one mm. possible interpretation of quantum mechanics, and every single physicist will tell you. And I interviewed several of them when I was researching uh, Fluke. We don't know. Uh, we just don't know. There, there's there's a, a very predictive equation that governs quantum mechanics that allows us to sort of understand patterns, and it's highly predictive and so on. But trying to understand what it means is beyond the scope of current human minds. <laughs> One of the interpretations is that the least amount of fiddling with the math that you have to do produces the many worlds interpretation, which is that basically there's a constant, infinitely branching universe and infinite copies of you, as well as infinite copies of the universe in which you don't exist. And this is where all the sci-fi ideas flow from. I mean, I would love for this to be answered. I, I don't, I can't imagine it's going to be answered in our lifetimes, but you know, it, it's, it's incredibly, incredibly difficult to understand because basically everything in the quantum mechanics world operates according to things that don't exist in the world we observe. And so, you know, even trying to come up with a vocabulary to explain it, and I've read, you know, many of these books, it just doesn't work. <laughs> like the, mm -hmm. the nature of causality, the way that things interact with each other, uh, the collapsing of the wave function, all this stuff, it just doesn't really work in, in the vocabulary we have to describe the world. And I think that's also one of those things where, you know, the, the, those who are scientifically hubristic are often not theoretical physicists because the, the, the theoretical physicists understand there's so much about the world we don't understand. And so I have, you know, plenty of disdain for scientists who say, oh, these religious fools, they don't understand how the world works. I mean, neither do scientists. I don't know. <laughs> that's, and that's the answer. And I think that's actually a really beautiful thing about the world is that I would be sad if we understood everything. I think it's I think it's one of the most wonderful things about being a human is getting to ask why and that process of discovery and grappling with those ideas. And I find meaning in that personally as part of what, what I uh, derive meaning from in my life. I get asked all the time the question, if you could tell your 20 year old self something give some advice what would it be and and what i often come down to is i wouldn't want to be talking to my 20 year old self because i think my 20 year old self was making a lot of decisions that are smarter than the decisions i would make in the long term uh, would would you if you could go in and change one of those little things back in in your life would you want to do it no. no. And I think, I think it's because it would change everything. I mean, yeah. I think this, I have this uh, phrase where I say how, you know, how changing anything changes everything. And I, 
I, I struggled when I was trying to convey the idea in, in, in Fluke that I don't mean this as some sort of abstract concept. I'm not sort of like making a metaphor. Mm -hmm. I literally mean that if anything was different about my life, everything would unfold differently. And this is where the sort of determinism that I was talking about before intersects with chaos theory is that you can simultaneously believe that there's a sort of unbroken chain of causes and effects, but that if any link in that chain was different, the entire structure would shift, right? So in that regard, I think if I changed anything in my past, my entire life would be different. And I have no idea whether it would be better or worse, but it would be profoundly, profoundly different. The what if questions about life are useful thought experiments to try to hone your decision making. But I don't actually literally believe that I could, I don't actually like literally yearn for a period of when I can change something that I did in the past, even the catastrophic mistakes in my life, because those have produced the moment that I'm in now, which I'm quite happy with. <laughs> so you know, I think that's one of the ways that also this worldview uh, helps with regret quite profoundly, is that, you know, when I think about this horrific experience of this mass murder of children producing me, I also have to think that the moments of regret in my life are inextricably linked to the most joyful periods of my existence as well. They couldn't exist without each other. So that makes me feel better because you know, the best moment in my life is causing the worst and the worst moment of my life is causing the best. It's all interconnected. As someone who just because of the nature of my work and calling happens to be with a lot of people as they're dying. One of the things that's that's always interested me is that when people start thinking about matters on their deathbeds, they almost never are talking about big moments. They're talking about being at the farmer's market with their kids on an October day or or these very, very small moments, not the big life-defining sorts of moments of triumph or of despair. And I've, I've always found that significant. I, I love that observation because I think this is the thing, you know, I I will say I changed my worldview quite significantly in the last like three, three and a half years in, in researching and writing this book. Hmm. And it's precisely because I think that I had this ethos that a lot of people do, especially when you grow up in the United States as I did, where it's sort of, you know, the way to live a successful, happy life is to basically just grab a larger slice of the world and control it. Right? It's yeah. like you want to have higher wealth. You want to control everything in your life. You want to, you know, sort of, you got your to-do list and checklist existence and all this type of stuff. And, and I think that what you just said is exactly aligned with what I have come to view as the lesson that I've taken away from this is that if I have less control, then I should just sort of enjoy life. I should enjoy the existence, not the, not the big moments that I'm working towards, but sort of just the, 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 the experience of existing. And what I've done more and more in sort of shifting this, and of course it aligned with the pandemic, which made a lot of people question you know, their day-to-day -day life and so on. I spend more time just around people I like, walking my dog, enjoying nature. And I think what really bothers me, and I sort of take, I have a, a bit sort of sharp elbows towards some of the, what I think are the worst parts of the self-help industry towards the end of the book, is I think that a lot of the modern messages are exactly the opposite of that. They say that if you just had a little bit more money, which you can manifest into existence by willing it to your desires, then you'll be happy. Mm -hmm. and, and I actually think that most people have the capacity to be happy with a lot less stuff yeah. <laughs> and a lot less status. And I think that most of, there's a, this juxtaposition between what we're told will make us happy, which is stuff and status, and what actually makes us happy, which is what you're referring to on the deathbed, which is those small moments of intense joy in life, experiencing the world with people you care about. And the reason those books don't get written in self-help very often is because <laughs> people it's don't telling buy them. people, you know, yeah, I mean, who's going to buy them that says, oh, I, you know, I feel despair. And the answer is you already have what you need. But yeah. I, you know, for a lot of people, I actually think that's true. I mean, I've seen some intensely happy people. It's not to say that, you know, poverty is not a serious scourge, but I've seen some intensely happy people. Uh, in my work in, in sub-Saharan Africa, who have way less stuff and way less status than I do. And they've found meaning and joy in stuff that doesn't require money. And so, you know, I, I think there's this aspect where that question about what you think is important on your deathbed, I wish we would ask ourselves that a lot more during our lives. And it's, it's one silver lining of the pandemic for a lot of people is people contemplated that a bit more when you had this sort of giant shift in in the world all of a sudden of what it, what is the point of my life and that sort of deathbed uh, reflection is something that if you have that when you are you know 
20, 30, 40, 50, 60, mm-hmm. you'll start to live a slightly different life than if you only sort of imbibe the, the, the sort of world of, of just control more of the world and you'll be happy. Yeah, that's why whenever anyone comes to me and says, I, I think I'm having a midlife crisis, I say, great. It is so much better to have a crisis at midlife than to have it on your deathbed. And so with with a crisis, there are all kinds of questions that could come up that you could actually start thinking about now. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we were that I quote corruptible at least once a week, I'm sure. And there are all kinds of reasons for that. But one of them is because I have noticed in church life, religious life, denominational life, exactly the pattern that you talk about in that book, which is that that sort of the dictator dilemma that, that you mentioned. You look you look at what happens to dictators and, and everyone else says who would want to who would want to do that. And I see in, for instance, the pastorate, a lot of the people who are the best equipped to be pastors are the very ones who are either leaving or who are questioning every week, should I leave? Because they just can't live through everything that that comes along with being a pastor right now, where a lot of sociopaths have absolutely no problem at all. With, with any of the stuff that comes along. And it, it worries me when I see the, the people who are kind of normal, well-adjusted people pulling back and disengaging and the people who are maybe in it for the wrong things plunging in. Is there anything that we can do about that? Yeah, it's it's a it's a great question because it's a really a chicken or an egg problem, right? Mm-hmm. That and, and I'll use the analysis of politics, which I know better than the pastorate. But you look at modern politics in the United States, and most people see a cesspool, right? They they see something where it's like, okay, this is a totally broken system with a lot of self serving people. Do I really want to join that group? right? Do I really want that to be my lifestyle? And the people who would be the best leaders are the people who are also saying no, right? That yeah. I don't want to touch that. And so what you have to do is you have to reform the system to make it attractive, and then you will get the good people, right? But you can't do that because the system is broken, so all the bad people are gravitating towards it. Mm-hmm. So you need to break the cycle, basically. And you also need to, and, and the way to do that is twofold. It's from above and below. So from above, you have to do systemic reform. So you have to make, whether it's the pastorate or the political sphere, attractive, where an ordinary and decent person who wants to serve rather than you know self-serve thinks it looks like a good idea and a vector for helping people. And at the same time, you have to get those path breakers who are willing to say, okay, I'm going to go into the cesspit, right? Like this is going to be terrible for me personally, but I'm going to be the person who actually fixes this. And you need both. And and the problem is that, you know, there's a vicious circle, I think, happening in systems of power that are broken where you don't have both. Instead, what you have is as the system gets more broken, it attracts more broken people. And, you know, this is the kind of stuff where, I don't know why, I mean, part of the reason why I wrote Corruptible was because I was getting sick of how every time something in power was bad, we always condemned the individual and never thought about the system. And it's all well and good. The individuals often behave badly and they deserve to be condemned, but we just keep on getting the same headlines, right? And Mm -hmm. you're like, well, I don't want to keep living in the same world. (laughs) Like, Mm -hmm. we just accept that this is how people in power behave. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, to me, that's the greatest social system question of the 21st century is how do you make it so that people who do not want power end up in it? It is going to be one of the hardest challenges socially for the 21st century. And I think it's probably the most important one because all of our systems govern, you know, what ends up being produced in terms of every single outcome in society. And you know, fundamentally, I don't think I haven't met anyone in the United States who says, I think the system basically works. Yeah. Uh, and that's a pretty bad indictment of what's going on, right? Like, there's no one who says like, yeah, I think our political system is exactly how it should be. And we want to live in a society where most people think that. What sort of thing should an institution, I'm, I'm thinking right now about, because I have a lot of experience in this world, people who are trying to deal with church sexual abuse, misuse of religious power when it comes to, to sexual abuse. 
And a lot of people are saying, well, this happens by definition because you can't tell who's doing it. You, you, you can't, uh, nobody's going to say as, as he or she's applying for something, yeah, and I'm a, I'm a sexual predator. What sorts of things should, should a, an institution do to try to make these sorts of positions more attractive to the right people and less attractive to the wrong ones? I mean, the, the, the fundamental principle is that people need to worry that they're going to get caught and they need to also have a systemic reform to attract better people in. So you're trying to do both things at the same time, right? So the people who are existing, you have to make it more likely that they will feel that they're about to get caught. And you also have to try to replace them. So there's sort of two things happening at the same time. Now, in terms of the first part, now, of course, this would not work with, with, with sexual abuse and so on, but with th things like embezzlement or abuse of power, setting up situation with sort of random stings. Embezzlement is one that I'll just give an example because it's very easy to figure this out. Setting up a, a, an attractive way to steal and seeing if anyone steals is one way to do sort of a random sting operation. The police do this now in lots of places. The NYPD had great effect in using this sort of sting operation. And you don't need to do it across everyone. You need to do it with a few people so that everyone understands that this is a possibility. And, you know, better oversight mechanisms, you know, more aspects of sort of oversight bodies that are randomly selected is also important because one of the things that happens is sometimes oversight, and this happens in business as well, oversight is being done with people who are trying to curry favor with the powerful. Right. Mm -hmm. And so they actually sort of keep quiet because they're also trying to climb up the ladder. So if you have randomly selected oversight bodies, this is the kind of thing where, you know, they don't care about power. They just want to get the right thing to happen. So there's a bunch of different things. And the other aspect is rotation. Right. I mean, one of the things that happens in abuse, and I know less about sexual abuse, but certainly with corruption, is that when people become cozy with each other, and they feel like there will never be a new person in that dynamic, they're more likely to commit abuse or corruption. So some mm -hmm. police departments will rotate personnel through, you know, every six months, give them a new partner every six months, and collusion becomes less common. So these are the kinds of things where, you know, you just take the principle from different realms of society. And while it's not the case that all power is interchangeable, there are commonalities. So if you look at how policing deals with these problems or politics with you know, the countries that have really effective anti-corruption oversight, those are the areas where I would look for what could we do in the church, right? And some of them are never going to work, right? I mean, you can't do the same things with police and, and with pastors. But some of them, the principles are things where they could inspire reform that internal review could say, hey, hang on. How can we make it more likely that the oversight will actually bite? Uh, how can we make it more likely that the, the, the individuals involved feel that there might be a rotation of personnel, et cetera, who might catch them? And there's not a silver bullet. I mean, it's just the kind of things where when groups think about this carefully, they have lower rates of abuse. And a lot of the worst abuse is happening in places where the least amount of eyes are, are actually thinking what can we discover? What, how can we actually design the system and make it uh, work better? One of the things that has worried me consistently since 2015 is that the Trump phenomenon would be normalized in, in all kinds of ways, that we would lose our, our sense of being able to even be shocked by yeah. some of this behavior. And, and, and by that, I don't, even, I don't even mean the corruption and, and those sorts of misuses of power, but the, the cruelty and the, uh, the, the lack of seriousness in terms of, of dealing with uh, people, that seems to, my worries seems to, seem to have been, they seem to have been valid because we, we seem to have an American culture that, that does see all of this stuff as just background noise and it doesn't matter. Do, do you think that's where we're going to continue to go in terms of this kind of cruel, theatrical, sort of demagogic sort of uh, life? Or is there a correcting mechanism out there somewhere? So, yeah, in the, in the short term, I have the exact same fears. And in the short term, I think that it's probably going to get worse before it gets better. And that's for structural reasons within the world around Trump. You know, there's, there's just sort of a structure politically in which cruelty is rewarded, even performative cruelty, right? Just making examples of people or, or being vicious uh, publicly and so on. At the same time, I will say, you know, I have interviewed some of the worst people that you can imagine, right? Because I, I, one of my, my, my previous work around corruptible and so on, I was interviewing people who had committed war crimes or who had, who had you know, ordered torture and so on, or had carried out torture. And in spite of all that, I think that the one thing that I've come away, even studying the worst of humanity, 
I think people are mostly just good and decent. I, I think this is a universal principle that is not the case for everyone. There's outliers, there's people who become vicious and so on, but I think humanity is good and decent. And at some point, I think that correction will happen. I don't know how it will happen in the political sphere and so on, but you know, I've been in, in many parts of the world where I've been in vulnerable situations where I could have been taken advantage of, kidnapped, you know, killed you know, in, in places that are very dangerous. And overwhelmingly, people have helped me. And so it's, there's this core belief that I have that when I look at the United States, it, that's the uplifting bit, is I think at some point, Americans are good and decent. And there, there will be a moment, I still cling to this hope, I, you know, I don't know how soon it will happen, when the spell breaks and we think, you know, what were we thinking? We can be better than this. And stop having this viewpoint about politics as what's better or worse between these two choices and instead thinking about what could we be as a society. And that debate isn't happening. I think it's, it's sort of a, an aspirational debate about is Trumpism really the best of us, right? And, and some people might think yes, and I don't understand that, but I think the correction is going to happen. I'm still very optimistic over the medium to long term. The book is Fluke, Chance, Chaos, and Why Everything We Do Matters. Brian Kloss, thanks for being with us today. It was a real pleasure and privilege. Thanks very much for having me. And I'll be right back with some more thoughts. Well... I think that was a fascinating conversation and went in a couple of directions that I didn't think it would go based upon uh, based upon reading the book. I think the, the fundamental difference uh, between Brian Kloss and me in terms of the way that we we see this is the question of whether or not there's something, someone personal at the at the root of, um, of, of the universe, whether impersonal forces are just moving us along, the, the physical construct of our brains, uh, or whether there is a meaning that's rooted in the fact that the universe isn't just chance, that you really do have a plot line to your life and you really do have a plot line to uh, to. Everything is is God actually at work in 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 all of the mystery of that. I mean, w- Christians have been arguing uh, for a long time about um, how does God's sovereignty relate to the fact that we are free choice making uh, beings. Materialistic science is arguing something similar, um, but the fundamental question of is the universe actually personal? Which means that I think I would have a, I don't think, I know, I would have a different perspective on the way that that Brian sees, for instance, regret. Uh, I agree with him that that even, even bad things uh, that, that we do often uh, end up working out for the good the good. I mean, obviously I'm a Christian. I believe that, uh, the crucifixion of Jesus was the most hor- horrific crime in, uh, in the history of the universe. And yet also was the way that God redeemed the world and, and defeated the devil. But I think there's something missing when there's not a, a sense of judgment and by judgment, I don't just mean kind of looking backward and saying, uh, did, did everything work out? But looking backward and saying, was this right and, and was this wrong? And a sense of not regret, but repentance uh, there. And I think a Christian view of reality actually answers those deathbed regrets better than an impersonal sense of, well, it'll all, it'll all work itself out somehow in the end. But rather to say, I'm a sinner, and yet in the grace of God, uh, I'm united to the storyline of Christ. I'm united to the plot of Christ. That means I'm forgiven, and that means that, um, that I have an inheritance in Him. That leads us, I think, away from a kind of fatalism, because if you think of uh, Romans 8, all things work themselves out. We, we quote that all the time. But that's in the context of the fact that we look around at the wreckage all around us in a fallen universe. And we look at the wreckage inside of ourselves as fallen beings. And the response, the scripture says, is we groan. We don't just see this as, well, this is just the way things are. And we certainly don't see this as, well, this is just the way that I am. We groan. 
And then we groan sometimes in utterances too deep for words, not knowing what to pray. Abba, Father, crying out, Abba, Father. I think that uh, Christian story actually uh, makes sense. Better than a multiverse, better than chaos. This is Russell Moore. You're listening to The Russell Moore Show, and we will see you next week. If you enjoy The Russell Moore Show, take a second to share this episode with a friend or leave a rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. The Russell Moore Show is a production of Christianity Today. Executive producers are Eric Petrick, Russell Moore, and Mike Cosper. Host is Russell Moore. Produced by Ashley Hales. Associate producers are Abby Perry and Mackenzie Hill. Director of Operations for CT Media is Matt Stevens. Audio engineering provided by Dan Phelps. Video producer is Abby Egan. And the theme song for The Russell Moore Show is Dusty Delta Day by Lennon Hutton.